So just a few weeks ago, Unity released Experimental Entities 1.0, which is the long-awaited 1.0 version of ECS. And in that, there have been a lot of significant changes since previous versions of ECS. Now, I do want to start diving more into detail on a lot of these new features because there's a lot of really awesome things that's going to be very powerful for us ECS developers. And so I want to kick things off talking about systems because when we think of ECS, that's the Entity Component System, which represents a separation between entities, components, and systems. Now, entities and components haven't really changed all too much, but there have been a number of significant changes to systems. If you've used systems in the past, they're going to be very familiar. However, there are a number of new additions to systems that we can utilize that make things a lot more streamlined as well as much more performance due to some code generation. Also, I know in the past there's been a little bit of confusion about what systems you should be using and when and where. So in today's video, I do want to give a little bit of clarity to all that. So anyways, in today's video, I'm going to start off with a little FAQ section just kind of going into detail about you know what systems are and give you some context about them so you get everyone kind of up to speed on that and then I'm going to be showcasing basically how to create these systems through code and some of the features that are available to us as of entities 1.0. I should point out that I'm going to be doing this in the experimental version of Entities 1.0, which basically means that the API is basically set in stone as far as what it's going to look like when it's production ready sometime next year. However, there may be some minor changes here and there, mostly bug fixes and things like that. So anyways, we'll just start off by talking about what is a system. Now, again, when we talk about ECS, that's the separation of entities, components, and systems. Really, that's just basically a separation between data and the logic that is actually transforming that data. So typically the data is going to be held inside components and the systems are what actually does the transformations on that data. So if we have, say, you know, a object that is at a specific world position and then we want to move that to another world position, well, we can use a system to take that data and then maybe some other data about how quickly it should move to that other position. And then it actually does that operation where it's updating that data, you know, each frame to get it to that target position. So really the key thing is that the actual data that we care about is going to be held inside of data components and then the transformations for that data are going to be happening in systems now systems don't typically contain data however they may have some helper variables and i can kind of go into a little bit more detail on that when we get to the kind of tutorial section of this video now all systems created in unity ecs are belong to what's known as a world now a world basically contains systems and entities and most often we're just going to have one world however in certain cases like multiplayer we have multiple worlds for or, um, one for the server as well as one for each of the client worlds and this is important to note because each world is only going to have one system of a particular type so it's basically a singleton so out of the box what do you get with a system now system it has kind of a basic life cycle associated with it so there's kind of you know equivalence to start and awake methods it's typically going to have an update method which is going to be called once every frame and it's going to have some cleanup methods such as the on destroy now as a new feature of entities 1.0 each system also has an entity associated with it. Now, this is extremely convenient because we can actually store data on that particular entity, which just kind of follows a little bit more in line with the entity component system pattern, where we do have a separation of data from systems. Now, in the past, sometimes if we needed to, say, store a value on a system, and then we had another system that needed to access that bit of data, well, we could just have a public field on the system, and then we could just get a reference to that system because, again, these systems are singletons, so they're fairly easy to get a reference to. And then from there, we can just kind of access access the data as needed. Now, again, things changed a little bit, so we can actually store the data on that system entity, and then from another system, we can find a reference to that system entity, again, pretty easily, and then from there, we can actually access the data associated with that. So it follows a little bit more in line with the entity component system pattern, and again, I'll be showing you that in the tutorial section of this video. So how do we actually define systems in code? Well, there are two ways that we can define systems in code. One is by using the system base class, and the other way is to use the iSystem interface. Now, you may come across some older code that uses component system or job component system or things along those lines you definitely want to avoid those because those are very outdated at this point the only two types of systems you should be using are system base or i system so what exactly is the difference between these two system types well the main difference is the types of data that we can actually access and use on these different types of systems now the system base because it is a class it allows us to access managed data from these systems so this basically means we can reference things like unity model 
mono behaviors or things that you know are not compatible with the burst compiler however conversely the i system interface we're going to define with a struct and so we can actually only access unmanaged data so these are basically you know fully burst compatible data components that are all made with you know blittable data types and everything like that also another advantage of the i system interfaces is that any code inside these i systems are all compiled with the burst compiler so in general it's going to have better performance than the system based counterpart now because system base is a class it gives us access to some features very conveniently out of the box and with i systems we do have to do like one little extra step to get access to the same things so there's going to be a little bit more code involved but it's not really all that difficult and i'll show you what i mean again in the tutorial section now if you've heard about ecs i'm sure you've heard about the high performance benefits and how it, we can really take advantage of the burst compiler and multi-threading through the job system so you may be wondering are systems themselves multi-threaded so systems themselves only run on the main thread any code that we write in systems are only always going to be running on the main thread however we can use systems to schedule jobs and those jobs can run on worker threads so that's where we can actually get advantage of multi-threading now because of that in general we want to keep the code inside of our systems relatively simple however we can schedule off more complex work into the job system if needed and then finally you may want to know how do we actually create these systems you know once we've written out a system in code how is this actually you know created and starts functioning in our game what well, actually happens automatically unity has this process called a bootstrapping process which basically creates the systems in our game and there again is a default one so any system that we just create out of the box is going to be automatically created by that built-in bootstrapper which is going to create the system and have it active in our world so it starts updating by the game now if you want to do things a little bit more custom there is a way that you can actually disable the automatic bootstrapper using a scripting define however i wouldn't recommend doing that unless you have a very specific reason to do so because you will need to create your own custom bootstrapper and instantiate all your system groups and systems yourself okay so here I am over in unity and I'm using a slightly modified version of the project that I use in my ECS 1.0 tutorial video I would recommend checking that video out because that's going to give you a really good introduction into unity's ECS and the 1.0 and all the features that are available to us in 1.0. Again, this one is going a little bit more into detail on systems. So anyway, that's what we're gonna do here. So we're just gonna create a couple basic systems to gather input from our player so we can move this zombie just straight forward. And so we're actually gonna do this in two separate systems just so I can show you the difference between system base and I system. Now, in theory, we could create both these systems using the I system interface. But again, I do just wanna give you some familiarity with the system base way to do things. So first thing we're gonna do is go ahead and create a system to actually gather input from our player. Now, once we have that input from our player, we're going to need to store it somewhere. So we're gonna go ahead and store it in the data component. So before I even create the system, we're just gonna go ahead and create a new data component, which is just a regular public struct, and we'll just call this the forward input. And it's just going to implement the standard I component data interface. And then we can just go ahead and create a public bool called value. So basically the idea here is this value is going to be set to true as long as we're holding down the W key. Now let's just go above that and we're gonna go ahead and start defining our system. So our system is going to be a public partial class. And the reason that we have to make it a partial class is again because of the code generation. But again, this is going to be our get player input system. And again, because I am using the system base here, we need to use the partial and class keywords and I see that we do have a red line under here if I do alt enter to implement the missing members you see that it implements this protected override void called on update and as you can imagine this on update is called once every single frame because of the system lifecycle and then you see here that this is just the basics of a system so we can actually come back to unity we'll go ahead and enter play mode and you see that of course right now nothing is really happening in our game However, if we do go to our systems window, we can do a search for get player inputs. And you'll see that here is our get player input system. You'll see that it is part of our default world, also in the tmg.zombies namespace. You see that the entity count and time are both empty. And that's because basically the system isn't even running because there's no entities to actually run the system on. And then if we just X out of that, you'll see that the get player input system, this automatically gets put in the simulation system group right here. Now, basically, it's just kind of random and arbitrary where the system gets put to begin with. However, it is deterministic. So basically, anytime that we enter play mode, these systems are always going to appear in this order. 
Now I have done a video in the past going into detail on how we can actually specify the system order and create our own custom system groups. I'll go ahead and link off to that video if you do want to watch. And by the way, if you don't have any of these special ECS windows, you can go up to window and entities and you'll see that here we have all these specific entities windows here and another thing i will show you is up in this entities hierarchy window we can also do a search for the get player input system and you'll see that this right here if we select this over in the inspector this is the entity that's associated with that particular system now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and add that forward input component onto this entity here so we can set the value through that system. So here we're gonna go ahead and use another of those um, built-in lifecycle functions. This one's the onCreate. You'll see it's another protected override void. And then on here, we're gonna go ahead and add this component type to our system entity. The way we actually do that is by using the entity manager. We can use the entity manager to do particular entity operations, such as adding and removing components, as well as changing data on them. Typically, there are better ways to do these types of things than using the entity manager. However, if it's something that's happening very infrequently, then the entity manager is just fine. So here, we're gonna go ahead and do an add components, and then it's gonna want us to do an add component type, which of course, we'll just do our forward input. And then you'll see inside the parentheses here, it's asking for either an entity, an entity query, a native array of entities, or a system handle. Now we wanna go ahead and actually pass in a system handle because that's how we can actually access the entity associated with the system. Now in system base, it's super easy to do. All we do is just type in system handle and that gives us access to the system handle. So now if we come back over to Unity, you'll see that when we enter play mode and select our get player input system, in the inspector, we do have a forward input value here. And then of course, we can just go ahead and use our kind of debugger to check and uncheck that forward input. So now we'll come back to our system. We'll go into the on update now, and we're gonna go ahead and actually update this value every single frame. So what we can do is say var current input is equal to a new forward input. And then here we'll go ahead and set the value equal to input dot get key key code dot w. Now you'll see that this is basically just the regular uh, Unity engine you know, input.get key. And this isn't like a managed type or anything like that. So again, we could do this inside of an I system, no problem. But of course, all we're doing here is just doing a get key so we can see if the W key is held down or not. Next, I'm just gonna go ahead and use the entity manager to do a set component data. And then here again, it's asking us for either an entity or a system handle. So we're gonna go ahead and pass in our system handle. And then for the data, we'll go ahead and put in the current input just like that. So basically what this means is that that every single frame, we're gonna go ahead and create a new variable for this forward input. And we're gonna set it to the value of whether the W key is held down or not. And then we're gonna go ahead and set that on our built-in system entity using our entity manager right here. So now we'll enter play mode, again, select our get player input system. Now over here, you'll see that here's the forward input. And then when I press and hold down the W key, you'll see that it is check marked. And when I release, it is unchecked. So again, check, uncheck as when I'm just, you know, tapping the key here. So great, we're now setting a Boolean. Now we're gonna go ahead and create another system that actually references the entity on that other system. And then depending on whether or not that W key is held down, we're gonna go ahead and move the zombie straight forward. So here we're gonna go ahead and define a public partial struct. This time it's going to be a struct, not a class. And that's because we're gonna be using the iSystem interface. So we'll just go ahead and call this the zombie move system. And then again, it's going to implement the iSystem interface just like that. Again, you'll see that we do have a red line under here. So if we go ahead and implement those missing members, you'll see that it actually wants us to implement three missing members here. And we do need to implement all of these. So there is the on create, on destroy, and on update. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and remove the uh, kind of default text that comes along with this here. So now here is our basis of our I system. One thing that I am going to do is just make this update after the type of get player input system so that we're always operating with the proper player input. And then another attribute that I ideally we would like to add on here is the burst compile attribute. Now the burst compiler again is gonna be the source of many efficiency gains for our application. So we do always want to use it when it is available to us. However, just adding the burst compile to the struct itself isn't enough. This basically just tells the compiler that, hey, something in here can potentially be compiled with the burst compiler. 
but it doesn't actually burst compile anything. What we need to do is go ahead and actually add the burst compile attribute to all these functions right here. And then so now when the burst compiler actually does its thing, it's gonna go through here and then any method is gonna be compiled with the burst compiler. So again, both of these at the struct level as well as the method level are required because again, this one's gonna tell the burst compiler, hey, there are some things that might need to be burst compiled on here. And then these ones actually say, hey, burst compile this specific method right here. And again, we can come over to play mode and you'll see that our zombie move system is happening right after our get player input system. So you'll see that it, again is automatically being created here. And again, if we do a search for it, you'll see that we do have a zombie move system in our entity's hierarchy because of course there is an entity associated with that system as well. Okay, now one thing that I should point out with these I systems is this system state variable that's passed into all these lifecycle functions. Now the system state variable is not to be confused with the system state components, which has actually been renamed to a cleanup component. I think it's a better name for that. But these system state components basically give us access to some particular things about the system. And this is necessary because in things like the system base, well, because it's a class and the way that inheritance works, we can basically just, you know, do things easy, like get this entity manager and this system handle right here. Well, again, in the I system, we do have to do a little bit of an extra step. So here we can do a state dot entity manager or a state dot system handle to get the system handle associated with that system. We can also get access to the world if we wanted to. So it's basically just kind of like a way that we can access, you know, anything associated with this system. For example, if we wanted to say disable this system, we could set the enabled property to false. Also in these system states, we can get things like component lookups and type handles. And it's often preferred to use the system state rather than the entity manager to do these types of things. Because when we use the system state, there's a lot of efficiencies as far as dependencies go that can be done using the system state versus just the entity manager. So again, that's kind of another efficiency win for I system over system base. Now to get back to the project that we're working on here, again, we do want to get a reference to the system handle on this get player input system. System. Again, so we can take a look at what the value of that variable is set to. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually just going to go ahead and create a private system handle here. And this is going to be our input system handle. Now, again, it's not necessarily always ideal to include variables inside of your I system, but some in some cases it does make sense to just cache some things so we're not you know constantly getting references to them. So in our on create, we can just go ahead and say input system handle. We'll go ahead and set this equal to the state dot world dot get existing system. And then in here we can pass in the get player input system. Now, if you have used Unity ECS in the past, you may recognize this get existing system. Now in the past, this actually returned the instance of the system. However, this get existing system, it now actually returns the entity associated with that system through the system handle. So now we can come down to our on update function here and let's just go ahead and set a var should move and then we'll go ahead and set this equal to the value of that forward input that's associated with our get input system so now that we have our system handle how we how do we actually get the data associated with that well of course we could use something like the entity manager where we could do a state dot entity manager dot get component data and then from here we can pass in the type of forward inputs and then again inside here it's going to allow us to pass in a system handle so we could use the input system handle so this is totally fine but again there's a better way to approach things than using the entity manager and that is another new feature as of ecs 1.0 which is known as the system API. Now the system API is really great. It provides us a lot of, you know, nice helpful wrappers to get some, you know, things like, um, you know, the time we can create entity queries with these. So again, we can do a system API dot get component. And then in here we can go ahead and pass in the forward inputs. And again, we'll just go ahead and pass in our input system handle just like that. And then at the end, we'll just do a dot value and that will get us the actual Boolean value associated with that forward input. So now we basically know whether the key is held down or not. So now we can say if should move. And now we're going to go ahead and move what is known as the transform aspect. I'm going to be going into aspects a lot more deeper later on. But the transform aspect is a built in aspect that basically any entity that has a world position, rotation and all that is going to have. And it's an easy way for us to say set a position or translate it throughout our world. Now to get that we're first going to need a reference to the entity. So I'm just going to do something kind of hacky here. And because I know that I just have one single entity in my game, I can go ahead and again, use the system API and do a 
get singleton entity against the zombie timer. Basically what this is gonna do is it's going to find the single entity with the zombie timer and just go ahead and return that entity um, inside this zombie entity here. Next, I can get the zombie transform by using the system API dot get aspect RW. Again, we're going to be uh, reading and writing to this aspect. So we do need RW rather than RO. This is called the transform aspect. And here we can pass in the zombie entity. Now again, we do want to normalize for frame rate. So we can say var delta time is equal to system API dot time dot delta time. That's basically how we can get the time operations in ECS. Again, it's by using this new system API. So now we can do a zombie transform dot translate local. We'll do a new float three uh, doing zero, zero and delta time. So that should just go ahead and move our zombie forward as long as the W key is being held down. So we will come back to Unity and enter play mode, and you'll see that when I hold down the W key, our zombie moves forward, and then when I let go, it stops. So again, forward and stop. And just to give you kind of a quick high-level overview again about what is going on, you'll see that we do have this get player input system. When we go ahead and select the entity associated with this, you'll see the value is either checked or unchecked, depending on if we're holding down the W key or not. And then again, after that, the zombie move system is going to run, and then if the W key is being held down, it's going to go ahead and run that system. If it's not being held down, it will not run that system. And so again, I'm just kind of showcasing a couple new features here. So this system handle, that's kind of how we get the uh, reference to the entity associated with each of these systems, which is created by default. Also with the I systems, there's this new system state, which is easy for us to you know, get access to a bunch of particular things. And then again, this system API, this is another you know very helpful way that we can say get and set components. Now, before I let you go, I do want to go ahead and show you off some generated code here. So actually, if we open up the file explorer and we navigate down to temp and generated code and then whichever assembly that you're running in, um, that's going to go ahead and show you all the code files basically generated in your game. So then you'll see we can find the, say, zombie move system. Go ahead and double click that. And then here is actually all the generated code that has been generated by the uh, C sharp source generation. Again, that's the reason that we need to put this uh, public partial struct is so it can actually properly generate all this code here. And you can see, we can take a look. You'll see that we do have a very similar on update function, which again, still does take in that system state here. And you'll see that it basically shows us kind of, um, you know, this say line 28 for the zombie move system here. If we go back over to our zombie move system on line 28. This is basically where we get that variable should move. And we set this equal to our system API dot get component, yada, yada, yada. So again, if we come over to here, you'll see what the code actually generates to. So you'll see that just doing that simple little one line operation. So first we actually need to do a state dot get entity manager dot complete dependency before RO, and then it passes in our forward input. So if, if there are any, you know, dependencies that need to be completed before that, it's going to go ahead and force those to completion. Next it's created this component lookup, which you can see down here. This is this right here, and it's going to go ahead and update that component reference. After that, we're going to go ahead and actually set that should move value again, using our component lookup here, passing in our input system handle dot value. So that's how we can actually get the, you know, component off that value. You. So I don't expect you to kind of like know all this stuff right now, but you know, definitely feel free to go ahead and actually check out your generated code so you can see, you know, what things are actually doing under the hood. You know, there is definitely going to be a lot more complexity, but I think it does help you get a better understanding of kind of what's going on in your project. So anyways, that's an overview about how to use systems in Unity's entity component system. Again, if you're familiar with Unity ECS, you'll see that they are pretty similar, but there is some more powerful things that we could do. And I've really been liking all the additions they've been adding so far. So anyways, if you do still have any other questions on systems, feel free to go ahead and leave those down in the comment section below or join us over on Discord over at tmg.dev discord. And with that, I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day and I'll see you in the next one.